On behalf of Epic Global, welcome to Epic Spotlight Series. My name is Anu. Our featured guest today is going to be Dinesh Patel of Protagonist Therapeutics. Before we begin the interview, what is Epic Global? Well, I've got the president of Epic Global here with me. His name is Robert DeFeo. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm doing great, Anu. How Thanks are you? Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm great. So would you tell us a little bit about Epic Global? Absolutely. So firstly, Epic Global is a nonprofit organization, but more importantly, we're a community. And we're a community of physicians, students, and professionals, all with a common passion for healthcare. And what we're up to basically is supporting our members. And we support these members through entrepreneurship, mentorship, and networking. That's fantastic. So how does one learn more about the organization? Well, epicglobal.org is a great place to start. We just updated our website, has a ton of new information, things like our history, our past events, future events, as well as new programs, of which there are several. In particular, next year, we're hoping to launch a mentorship program that's more structured way to really get members to interact with each other, um, but also more great events. So if anyone wants to be more involved with the community, please go to epicglobal.org or reach out to me directly. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So folks, now on with the interview with Dinesh Patel of Protagonist Therapeutics. Hi, Dinesh, and welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. I look forward to this dialogue. Yes, absolutely. So you are president, you are CEO, and you are uh, the director of a company called Protagonist Therapeutics. It's a publicly traded company. You have more than 35 years of executive, entrepreneurial, and scientific experience spanning the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and biopharmaceutical industries. Prior to Protagonist, you were CEO of a company called Aret Therapeutics. And the company was focused on the development of drugs for um, metabolic syndrome. Prior to that, you were co-founder and you were CEO of Mikana. That was an oncology-based company. That was acquired by Entremed in 2005. And prior to that, you were um, a co-founder of Versacore. Versacore was acquired by Pfizer in 2005 for $1.9 billion. You began your career in 85 at Bristol Myers Squibb. You've earned your doctorate from Rutgers University in chemistry, and you've studied for undergraduate, you've studied industrial chemistry back in India. My first question to you is a two-part question. What does Protagonist Therapeutics do, and how did you end up at the company? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question, and it has been quite a journey because I have been with the company since uh, 2008. Uh, I think in all the undertakings uh, that uh, have come in my life, uh, there are two fundamental things I would focus on, and, and uh, most entrepreneurs and CEOs would focus on. One is uh, you have a particular expertise. Uh, uh, so you want to use that, uh, but you have to make sure that you use it to uh, attend to some significant unmet need. It's uh, If I'm very good at making a paper cup, but somebody has already done that job efficiently, then you know there is not going to be much demand for it, right? So the unmet need a component has to be there, and and the other is like you know you're not the only genius who figures out these are the unmet needs. There are uh, many very competent people. So the next component is you have to make sure that whatever you are doing offers ideally significant superiority or at least some strong differentiation from anything and everything that is out there. So protagonist, I I, I think uh, qualifies in both of those categories. Uh, we work in the field of what is referred to as peptide drugs. So, you know, there are two categories of drugs. One is small molecules, the oral pills and capsules we take, you know, whether it is aspirin, Tylenol, Lipitor, things of that nature. And then there are the big biologics and proteins and antibodies, uh, typically injectables, uh, drugs like Humira and Remicid, that sort of thing. Peptides are sort of like in between. They are a little bit bigger than small molecules, but much smaller than the big proteins. So 
you can see that they have their unique characteristics and, and can offer some advantages uh, in, in certain disease areas. So we are focused exclusively on peptides and we are working in two different categories of diseases. Uh, we have three drugs in four different clinical stages of development, uh, all proof of concept studies and all addressing unmet needs. Um, and these are all homegrown tomatoes. It's uh, the, all the drugs we have invented uh, in a de novo fashion from scratch. One category of drugs is uh, the rare diseases. So these are by definition uh, diseases where there are 200,000 or less patients in, in the US. Uh, there are various blood disorders uh, uh, and some of them are very rare. Like people typically complain, complain about being anemic or not making enough red blood cells. Guess what? There are some individuals who make excessive red blood cells. So then that blood is very thick. So it's referred to as the disease of thick blood. And uh, it's prevalent in about 160,000 patients. Uh, and companies like ours will attend to that. So we have a wonderful drug. It's called PTG300. It's a mimetic of natural hormone hepcidin, which exists in our body. And uh, we recently got some wonderful data, which kind of have changed the fortunes of the company, so to speak, in the past few months. Now, in the, at the other end, we are also working in what one would refer to as blockbuster categories of drugs. So this is where Humira comes into play. Humira is the largest selling drug of modern times. I mean, last fiscal year, garnered 20 billion plus in revenues. But Humira is an injectable antibody drug. Uh, it's a very powerful immunomodulating agent. There are lots of side effects, black box warning, that sort of a thing. So what we are doing in that space is we said, we'll come up with peptides and you know who cares whether it's a peptide or an antibody, but the differentiating fact is these are oral peptides. So you will take it as a pill. And more importantly, it's gut restricted. So we are targeting inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. These are chronic diseases. The patients unfortunately have to take medication for the rest of their lives. And wouldn't it be better if they can take an oral pill instead of an injection? And better yet, because it is a disease of the gut. So if your drug is confined to the gut, then you are creating hopefully better safety down the road and much fewer side effects. So that's the big idea. And, and the, the idea has been embraced and validated. So one drug we have, uh, we are having a partnership with uh, Janssen, the uh, pharmaceutical unit of Johnson & Johnson. It's a billion dollar deal. They have already paid us $80 billion so far. So it's not just biotech bucks, it's real. And we have a drug that we gave to them and they have it in phase two Crohn study right now. And we also have a research collaboration where we are, are working on backups and second generation drugs. And then there is another drug that we are developing on our own and, and taking it forward. It is in phase two study in ulcerative colitis. Now the beauty over here is that uh, we are capturing the best of both worlds. You know how risky our biotech business is. Things fail more often than they succeed. So what we said is like, hey, we are so novel and unique. We are oral gut restricted. That is strong differentiation. So why to take the biology risk? Let's work on those biological targets that are already validated by these injectable antibody drugs. So in both the drugs, we are working on pathways where there are already injectable antibody drugs on the market. So we don't have to worry about the biology risk or the mechanism risk. Uh, uh, and, and that's a huge advantage. And that is why the Janssen's of the world are partnering with us. We are providing them an extension of their Stellara franchise, transitioning from injectables to orals and you know, a lot of other attractive features. So that's what Protagonist does. But you know how I ended up with Protagonist is a very interesting set of coincidences. As, as you mentioned, uh, I was at uh, Versacore Vicuron. I was um, 
uh, a, a co-founder over there. And uh, admittedly, this is the biggest success story of my career uh, so far, Versacore. And I will never get tired of saying, you know, we started with 5 million in 1996, took the company public in 2000 at a pre-money of 200 million plus, and Pfizer acquires us in 2005 for close to $2 billion. And uh, so that's good. But then what, right? So if, if you are a real entrepreneur, it's like, hey, anybody can get lucky once. Can you do it again and over and over again? So the zeal is there. Um, and then I did Arit and McKenna in, in, for a few years in a row. But the, we are now talking about the second half of 2008. And I said, it's time to do something totally new. And uh, forget the VCs, I should do enough, I have enough money. My wife will always disagree, but uh, 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 it's like, let's try something genuinely on our own with our own money. So I go to India for a few weeks with the intent of like, I'll set up something over there uh, and then I'll have the front office here. It will be a combination of like, okay, uh, you know, uh, fee for service as well as research activities, that sort of a thing. And by the time I come back from India, this is the second half of 2008, the economy was tanking like crazy, our bank balance was vaporizing, and also um, talk about timing. We had undertaken a very expensive renovation project. So very quickly, it's like, okay, let's change plans. But fortunately, uh, I, I was just stuck up on doing something very different, and, and this thing came along where I got introduced to a company called Protagonist, which was in Brisbane, Australia. And anyway, one thing leads to the other. Uh, I go to Brisbane, talk, uh, meet with the founder, Mark Smythe, he's still with us, uh, amazing individual at the University of Queensland. And uh, one thing leads to the other, and I'm like, okay, uh, I'll take this on. So now I'm the CEO, but I'm the only employee here. My day starts at 2 p.m. typically because that's the next day, 8 a.m. in Australia, that sort of thing. Every quarter, I'll get on the plane, be in Brisbane for about a week or 10 days. And this went on for almost three years. And, and uh, these were very frugal days. And, and uh, we barely had a few million. We did have you know, we were able to attract Lilly Ventures, the investment arm of Eli Lilly as one of the main investors. So that was about four and a half million, that kind of thing. But it then became very clear that if I really want to make something happen, a US presence has to be created. We have to earn some partnerships to validate the technology platform. Nobody believes you in the beginning, no matter how hard you scream, but all of a sudden you sign a research collaboration and the question is not even asked. It's like, oh, some, other company believes in this, they, they are writing a check to you, so it must be true and good. So that's, the, that's how I got involved in Protagonist and that's how the company got started. What an interesting story. Thank you, I'm glad I asked you that question. Yeah, no, it, 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 it has been fun. And you know, it's like just me as the sole employee here and having 15 people there, that was 2008. Now we have 80 plus employees here in the US and uh, we still have five, six people in Brisbane, Australia. Haven't been there in a few years, but you know, uh, the, the Zoom calls and all that is helpful, right? So. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's so remarkable. That's remarkable. Um, my next question for you is, can you share some major trends in pharma, that, some major trends that you believe will affect pharma going forward? and also protagonist in particular. Right, right. So, you know, uh, uh, Versacor, uh, the company that Pfizer acquired, we were focused on antibacterials, antifungals. And it has been interesting to watch the whole evolution and, and the roller coaster ride of anti-infective drugs. A time comes when the country and the globe feels like, oh my God, uh, will be wiped out by a virus or a bacteria. So we need those drugs. And then we come up with those drugs, but you know, an antibacterial, you need a medication for one week, two weeks, that kind of a thing, you are done. So how does one make money over there? Uh, uh, 
so it, it, it kind of goes up and down, but now all of a sudden, and honestly, just last year, qu quite a few anti-infective companies, two in particular, one in the Bay Area, one in Boston, they got drugs approved, and still they had to vanish, uh, uh, almost for like sold for peanuts, so to speak. Now all of a sudden we are in the COVID era, and we cannot spend enough money on coming up with drugs against a virus, right? So uh, that is one trend. I, I, I think that the COVID example especially is going to teach us that we always need to have some ammunition ready and be a few steps ahead of the bugs, so to speak, if we want to survive as a human species. Otherwise, we could get wiped out. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating it a bit, but you get the point, right? The other is uh, we are all, you know, as humans, we are beginning to live longer. So, so clearly, uh, all of a sudden, we are now becoming aware of diseases or at least paying attention to diseases that didn't exist or we didn't acknowledge before. Uh, whether it is, you know, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, and now uh, other CNS-related uh, things like depression, for example, uh, uh, clearly people are beginning to acknowledge that. So, so I think CNS drugs, uh, it's a very difficult nut to crack, but, but that is what I believe is going to grow in importance, in, 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 in my opinion. And then uh, finally, it's uh, the, the rare diseases, right? The, that's always like, who is going to pay attention to a disease that affects only a few thousand people? And, and that is where I think it's a blending of uh, medicine with some uh, kind of humanitarian approach, if you will. And the US FDA is also helpful. The rules and criteria for getting rare disease drugs is, is uh, you know, those are more relaxed rules and, and uh, compared to the regular drug development path. So I think that is something that one needs to continue to attend to as well. And then finally, it's like the, no matter what we work on, we will have to create more efficiency. Drug pricing, right? It's a, a constant challenge. And, and uh, our sector has tried hard, right? We said, oh, computational science will come and instead of making 10,000 analogs, we will come to this kind of precision that we will know exactly which molecule to make. We will make only one and that's it. So it will reduce all the spending, all that kind of thing. Well, that is not turning out to be true. We still spend over a billion dollar per drug that is approved on an average. So it is an expensive proposition, um, but yet we have to one way or the other figure out how to keep everybody happy, meaning how to get the prices lower and at the same time not curb true innovation. So it's a challenge that continues. So those are some of the things that I think Will, will continue. And uh, at, at, at Protagonist, I mean, what we have done on purpose is uh, we have tried to create a balance. At one end, we are going after the blockbuster drugs. So this is where, like I said, with Janssen, we have a billion dollar biotech deal. Uh, on the other end, we are attending to some rare diseases. The other advantage there is like, because it's a rare disease, because the development path is shorter and simpler, we as a small company can take it all the way to the finish line and then get, get the drug on the market and even set up a commercial and sales infrastructure and, and, and you know, uh, distribute the drug ourselves. Uh, uh, so we have played with those two kind of extremities uh, on purpose, if you will. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. So with companies consolidating in pharma, there's globalization. How, what are the benefits? What would be the benefits and also the challenges for protagonists? Yeah, so you know, globalization is a phenomena that is obviously uh, affecting and influencing all aspects of life, uh, personal, social, professional, and it's affecting companies as well. Um, an example that comes to mind out of blue is 
Takeda Pharmaceuticals, a Japanese company, but guess what? They are totally becoming a US-centric company. So now their headquarters is here, their CEO is a US citizen, uh, a, a white male, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, not a Japanese guy, that, that, that's my point over here. And then a, a lot of mergers and acquisitions are gonna occur uh, uh, within the US or uh, around the globe. It's like uh, once a company gets to a certain level, then uh, it, it becomes like a prime candidate for acquisition. And uh, what a bio tech company does uh, and what we do in particular at Protagonist is like we are ready for all scenarios. So very three basic scenarios, right? One is you're going to continue to develop the drug on your own. Uh, so go out there and make sure funding is available. And uh, if there is one thing among several things that I have learned is like Try not to run out of money. So, so uh, uh, because otherwise it just uh, kind of puts the whole company, uh, employees, management, board, everybody in, in very tough compromising situations. So uh, for example, now we have 200 million plus in cash. So that is cash runway for almost the next three years. So it, it gives us the flexibility of doing things the right way. And the street has been kind to us. So we are able to raise money. The other is like uh, do a partnership. So we have a partnership with Johnson & Johnson around that and, and, and it gives you the validation. It gives you non to financing, if you will. And uh, uh, so you share the risk and you share the reward also. So it's, it's a very nice uh, uh, approach. It's a win-win situation. And then the third is of course the acquisition, that sort of a thing. Uh, a lot of times companies are started, uh, especially if, if they are funded by VCs, venture capitalists, sometimes with the notion of like, hey, you'll focus on one idea, one drug, uh, get your phase two clinical proof of concept, and then we will sell the company. That almost doesn't work, or it creates such a misalignment uh, uh, within the company, outside the company, it's totally flawed. Now, never say no to that, but at the same time, you, 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 you can't be banking on it. Uh, but ultimately, yes, uh, as protagonist grows or as the assets mature, uh, all different scenarios come up. And, uh, you know, the standard slogan that, that I have memorized uh, based on the advice from my investor relationship uh, group is that, hey, protagonist is keeping all options open at all times. Right? So, yeah. But we will never get desperate. Uh, <laughs> right. Interesting. So where where is protagonist positioned in the marketplace? Yeah, we, uh, th this brings back some interesting memories also. So uh, 2008, 2009, our 2009 budget was, the total budget was $4 million. And, and, and now we are spending much more than that in a month. Uh, uh, and, 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 uh, but that is because, not because we are careless, we are still very frugal. Ask any of our employees and they'll be like, oh God, Dinesh is so tight with money. Uh, uh, but uh, for, the, for the right reason. So we have come a long way. Uh, we have had our own bitter experiences. We have uh, uh, learned from that and, you know, uh, our mantra is if it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger. But right now we are in a very good position and uh, very great trajectory is being envisioned. So our market cap is around 800 million. So every employee, including me, is like, when are we gonna cross the billion dollar mark, right? That, that, that will be a, a, a proud moment for uh, all of us. Uh, so I think we, we, it's fair to say that we have transitioned successfully from a startup to a public company to a small cap to now kind of like the mid cap in our biotech sector. Anything that is from 750 million to 2 billion qualifies in that category. And since we have multiple assets with very different attributes, uh, I think the valuations are, 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 are going to 
pile up upon uh, each other in our opinion. So the, 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 the assets are gonna come to fruition, meaning the outcome of the phase two studies, it's like one asset, we will know about it by the end of the year and next year. With another asset, it will be towards the end of next year. With the third asset, it will be the year after that, that kind of a thing. And uh, so uh, the, the optimistic scenario is like, this is gonna be a nice upward trajectory. But, uh, you know, uh, time will tell and uh, we will see where we go. But right now, we, we, we really are, are glad about the position that we are in, the spot that we are in. It's an exciting time for you guys. Totally, totally, is. totally yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I'd like to pivot the conversation here. And I wanna actually go back to your beginnings. Tell, tell me where you grew up, what was your childhood like, your family like, and, and how, you know, how, how has that influenced you? How has your upbringing influenced yeah, you into yeah. the person that you are today? No, I think it's a, 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 you know, we all, as we grow up, we analyze our upbringing and our life and, and we come to an understanding or assessment of uh, what helped us and what didn't help us. So my dad is, is a farmer. Uh, I come from a very small village of uh, back in India, uh, where the population is about 1500 people even today. And uh, my parents are in the village. They are very healthy, living happily. We visit them once every year. This year would be an exception because of the COVID thing. Uh, but th those, th that's where my roots are. Now, what is interesting is that uh, right from the get-go, my dad, my uncles, one thing they concluded is that, okay, we are farmers, fine, but if our kids are to have any future, they should run in the opposite direction. And education was considered the meal ticket. So that's, that's how we got into education. Now, the problem is, as you can imagine, in a small village, uh, how much education you're gonna get. And, and fortunately, my dad, my uncle, they were all like, uh, once you decide on something, you just go for the best. So we were sent to the city. So I grew up in Baroda uh, in, in, in Gujarat, uh, wonderful city. And uh, so the, 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 the dilemma over here is like, my parents are in the village. Uh, they want us to be in the city to get a good education. So that led towards being in a prep school. And uh, um, there was only one prep school in Baroda at that time. It was the most expensive one. So they had to swallow some uh, big expenses, but that was it. And, and that I, I think, uh, uh, so you will like this point. So this was a prep school where the kids from US, England, Africa, you know, these are the parents who wanted their kids to have some education in India and uh, experience the culture, so to speak, but they, don't, they are living outside of India. So, so they send their kids over there to that prep school. So when I'm there at school in the school year, I'm surrounded by the most sophisticated, well-educated, affluent, kids, so to speak, and, and the, the school was just at a A plus level in, in all aspects. And then when comes vacation time, right? Diwali or the summer vacations, I go back to my village and my you know, cousins and other friends are waiting for me. And, and these are like, I mean, total native village environment. And, and so the whole conversation or the observations, there was just so much contrast. And that I think was the richest experience in my life. Uh, then I went to college uh, uh, at uh, Vidyanagar, so which it, is, it is a town near Anand, and uh, that is where I met my wife. Uh, she is from Anand. She is the granddaughter of the founder of Amul, Amul Dairy. Big name. Uh, uh, yeah, big name and, 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 and a big contrast also. And now we have been married for uh, 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 close to 40 years. And she is like, that was 
you were so lucky, you had that great experience. And she grew up in a privileged environment and she just didn't see the real India or the rural India or all that. But now that she's married with me, you know, now she is exposed to all that. And uh, But I think that was the most fantastic experience uh, uh, for me. It trained me very well and, and probably gave me this uh, confidence, sometimes it translates into overconfidence, uh, uh, but that has been a good virtue and, and uh, gives me the ability to not lose my identity uh, uh, in front of no matter who the other person may be. And at the same time, I can also go to the other extreme and be incredibly humble and considerate uh, when I'm meeting with some individual who can benefit from that kind of approach. Yeah. So I'm curious, tell me about how you became an entrepreneur. What was your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, you know, uh, 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 so people become entrepreneurs for different reasons. And when you are young, you are full of, uh, what should I say? arrogance uh, 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 so it's it's like there is only one way to do it and I know how to do it and I should be doing it that kind of a thing so, so that bug was there in me uh, but 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 anyway the way my journey went was like I, I went to college back in India and then it became pretty clear so I did try starting a company there that sort of a thing and and uh, uh, as you know things go very slowly in India, especially if you are a nobody and you, 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 you have uh, uh, no influence, influential name behind you. So I came to this country as a student, uh, uh, fresh off the boat, landed at, in New Jersey at Rutgers. Uh, and then uh, my wife, who was just my uh, college mate and a very good friend at that time uh, uh, from India. She comes after a year, we get married. And, and uh, she's also a chemist by training then, uh, just like me. She also uh, joined Rutgers. Uh, but all along, I had this, I refer to this as the India disease. I'm like, okay, um, I'll get my PhD. Then we are going back to India. We'll start a company there, that kind of stuff, things like that. And, and she was in a very different situation. All her siblings and uncles and aunts, they are all over here. So she's like, she wants to stay over here, that sort of a thing. Uh, uh, so, so it was a very tough dilemma that went on for years. And uh, I was like, nope, uh, I am an entrepreneur and I have to go to India and start a company. Then in 1993, so after I finished school, uh, my PhD and then postdoc at Madison, Wisconsin, I joined Bristol Myers Squibb in Princeton, New Jersey and worked there for seven plus years. Um, in 1993, my boss at that time, he moves over here to the Bay Area to join this company, FMX, to head up all the discovery development. And after eight months, he convinces me to move to the Bay Area. And that was really a turning point, so to speak. Within one month, I was cured of the India disease. And, and, and what I mean by that is the following. It's like, okay, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Guess what? This is the best place on planet Earth to be an entrepreneur. Why to go back to India? The second was, uh, oh, the weather and all that. In, uh, on the East Coast, it's called, well, here the weather is uh, great. Uh, now, more recently, it has been different, but hopefully, you know, it will get back to the normal days. And the third was the uh, ethnicity and multi-ethnicity. So the Bay Area is, is, is uh, uh, you know, a great spot that way. Uh, there is an incredibly nice blend of all nationalities and all that. So those were the three criteria that then basically got me cured of the India disease. My wife was so relieved. And uh, since 1993, we have been in the Bay Area and uh, have stayed here ever since. Lovely, fantastic, fantastic story. So then, so Dinesh, what, what's the best mentoring advice that you have received over your career? Yeah, it's a, uh, that's a pretty deep question. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. Uh, 
it sounds very simple at some level, but it's it's pretty complex and nobody is gonna really come and tell you A, B, C, these are the things you do and you'll be successful and, and that kind of stuff. And even if somebody says it, nobody is gonna take it with, with any level of seriousness. What, what I found is that the best way help was provided to me was by very kind, considerate people, very smart people, and I was fortunate to be surrounded by incredibly smart and successful people. They would make an observation of what your strengths are and what are the things you need to work on. And, and these are very polite individuals, so they will immediately encourage you to continue with your strengths, things like that, right? They will compliment you. Uh, they'll give you a big raise, a big recognition, all those kind of things. And, and, but then from time to time, and most of the time in a subtle manner, they will be like, um, suggest areas of improvement. So in my case, it was like, never lose your confidence and enthusiasm. Uh, keep that energy. You will attract the best talent like a magnet, and you will create great teams, that kind of thing. And in terms of the areas of improvement, uh, I remember this one event where once it was my colleague who said, Tinesh, you realize, right? You are your worst enemy. I'm, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you yourself get in your way. You, you are almost there. Uh, uh, the decision is going your way. And then you lose your temper. And, and that ruins everything. Uh, uh, and then my boss at some stage also mentioned the same thing. Uh, in fact, in that particular instance, he himself was the victim. He, he was a very well composed guy throughout his career. But once he lost his cool and he's like, Dinesh, I realize once you lose your temper, you have lost the argument. No matter what, what, whether you are right or not, you are done, uh, that sort of a thing. So those are, 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 are the kind of things that, that stay with you forever. Uh, uh, but the best mentoring that I got was during my Versaco days. So uh, as, as we talked before, that's the company where I was a co-founder, things like that. I was uh, the head of discovery. Uh, and, and so I was a science guy. And, and uh, uh, the way we started Versacor was like, you know, this company, FMX, which brought me to the Bay Area. Uh, I joined in 93, and then in 94, Glaxo Welcome writes a check of 500 million plus. It is acquired. We all make a ton of money. And youth is uh, arrogance and ignorance. And I'm like, this is easy. Let's do it. So uh, my boss and I, we, we, we start Versacor with $5 million. But then we quickly realize it's not that easy, and we bring in a CEO. Uh, George Horner, uh, and, and my original boss left, and now it is George and me. But George was a uh, former sales guy, guy from Abbott, uh, uh, so he was more on the marketing and business side of things. And I come to a stage where I'm like, let me move on, you know, uh, find something. And uh, Versacor was a 40-employee company at that time. I find an opportunity to head up uh, all of discovery preclinical at a Bay Area public company. And it's like, I'll have a staff of 120 people. So I go there with my resignation letter to my boss, George Horner. And he's like, so Dinesh, you are an incredibly good science guy and you will certainly excel there uh, and, and all that stuff. But that is one way to grow, but the other place to grow. And he said, and this was important, uh, for me, he said, I can see that you have a sense for business and money. And that could be the other path for you, where you blend in your science expertise with your natural inclination towards business and finance. And, and that was transforming for me. So this mentoring thing, uh, uh, the, the point is like, uh, it's not like you have to have hourly sessions every week or every month. Uh, you, you, you just have to uh, be at a place and fortunate enough to 
have somebody of greater influence who then makes a suggestion of some sort and uh, then you have to act on it. I could have easily gone to the other company and who knows how that would have turned out. Uh, but instead I made this controversial choice of saying, yeah, let me stay with Versacor. And then I started taking charge of business development and George was like, I'll take you for all the money raising activities when we go to VCs and all that. And the IPO roadshow, the private jet and all that kind of stuff, those were fun experiences. And the VC contacts were then later on very helpful when I started my own companies and you know that kind of a thing. Uh, so I, I think you have to allow people to observe you and then you have to listen very carefully to what they are saying and also what they are not saying. And, and that will really help you in figuring out your, what are your strengths are and what are the things to, you need to work on and stuff like that. So that, that's how mentoring has been very helpful for me. Sure. You are, no question, an, a, a tremendous industry leader. So as an industry leader, what have been some of the most important leadership lessons that you have learned? Yeah, that, I, I, I think, so a leader needs to lead and there is something uh, uh, there to lead. And what I mean by that is, uh, so there are two, two, two things. Uh, I have found it incredibly useful that the, the simplest Think to, well, it is not the simplest thing to do. Uh, uh, it may be the hardest thing to do, but you should always lead by example. If you want your people to work hard, you yourself have to work hard. If you want your people to be smart and creative, you yourself should try to be smart and creative, things like that. But then the other component is that you totally have to realize that no matter what, you are simply not going to be great at everything. And very, very early on, I was fortunate enough to acknowledge in my own head, if not in public, uh, about where am I really good and, and, and where am I not? And then whether it was my personality, passion, bubbling, enthusiasm, energy, but it's like, I was able to attract great talent. And protagonist is a great example. Uh, 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 the, our chief medical officer, uh, so this is a digression, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, his name is Samuel Sachs. Sam is, is, is a legend. He was a Genentech. He was the number two guy after Ernie Mario at Elza. I mean, Elza was acquired for what, 14, 20 billion? And then he was the founder and CEO of Jazz Pharmaceuticals for the first six years, things like that. The guy obviously doesn't have to work for money, uh, but here he is, our chief medical officer. At, at, and and uh, uh, he started as a consultant advisor, part-time employee, and, and slowly, you know, uh, he, he, he liked what we were doing and now he loves it and, and he believes we are, we are doing great things together. So you have to, attract the best talent at any given time that you are able to attract and, 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 and effort, uh, effort. So those, those two things, lead by example, uh, uh, you, you can't be slacking off and expecting others to uh, be dedicated and hire the best talent that you can. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, being a leader, I'll tell you, what a leader shouldn't be doing. A leader shouldn't always, shouldn't be always the nice person or the nice messenger. Sometimes it's okay or almost a necessity to, you know, have some tough love and pep talks and all that and, and, and uh, be very transparent. Um, people don't like it in the beginning, uh, but then after a while they realize that no, there is an element of truth and, and no one person is being singled out. It's like very, 
universal and it is nothing personal and it is in the best interest of the company. So as long as you are cre keeping the best interest of the task or the company in mind and then giving your narration of like, hey, you need to do this, but you are not doing it so, or we can do this better and that kind of thing. So those things are also important to do, sometimes give the tough message uh, or slightly bitter message. Uh, in the long run, it totally gets appreciated also. So, so you have to create a very honest and transparent system that way. And, and, and be clear about like, this is nothing personal. This is in the best interest of protagonist. Uh, I think those are the, some of the things that <clears throat> come to mind in terms of the, the leadership quality. Oh yeah, and by the way, the other thing is like, whatever I will talk about today with somebody, and even if it was a tough dialogue, the, the next day, things are totally, totally back to normal. And, and, and so you don't carry it on, right? It's like, there was a purpose, there was a reason, we had this dialogue, now let's get back to work. If that makes sense. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. Um, what have what have you failed at? Uh, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, so three failures. And there will be more to come. That's life. Um, so growing up, I went to this prep school and all that kind of thing. Uh, what I didn't realize was that, uh, I won't get into the details, but long story short, I had all the grades and credentials to go to medical school, but I couldn't go to medical school, didn't get the admission because of the complications of, well, this school is for, it is following this education system and all the medical schools in Gujarat are in the other kind of system that got, it got messed up. So that was a blow. Um, but time heals everything. and. After that, I was very, very lucky uh, on totally upward trajectory all along. So from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, let's fast forward to 2008. This is when I was the CEO of a red uh, and uh, we, were developing a drug that would revolutionize the field of medicine because it was gonna be a single drug working through a single mechanism that would be a treatment for both diabetes and hypertension. And funding was no issue. Our Series A was led by very top tier investors from the Bay Area, Series B, we had so many inquiries and we rejected everybody because all the existing Series A investors, nobody wanted to give up their pro rata share. And um, so, and then a big pharma company. So in total, we had 50 million from VCs. A big pharma company makes us an offer saying, you do your phase one, phase two study. If phase two is positive, we will write you a big check. You will all be very happy. And even right now, we will pay you the 50 million. So the VCs become neutral in terms of their investment. And all the expenditure of running the company, we pay for that. We were so full of ourselves, we turn it down. And, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, clinical studies are clinical studies and to our shock and disaster, things didn't materialize. And, and so that was, that turned me upside down. And that, and that was like, how could this be happening? And that is where I said, screw this. I'll start my own company, create a little uh, shop in India and have a front face here. And, you know, we talked about that earlier, that sort of a thing. So, so, so that was very, disappointing and, and uh, it, it's, uh, boy, talk about, uh, uh, you know, going from a high to a low. Um, but once again, you, you have to have the ability to dust it off and, you know, start all over again, hit the reset button 
And then I started the protagonist journey in a slow and steady way uh, uh, from 2008 onwards. And uh, um, in the beginning, we had strategic investors, so Lilly Ventures, then JJDC, the investment arm of Johnson & Johnson. Then we did do the MES round and bring in Canaan uh, as a VC, only one VC investor, but take the company public in 2000. And things are going great, and, and we had this wonderful phase to study with our IBD drug. And, and uh, you know, our stock, we did the IPO at 12, our stock is at $20. We were gonna do some interim futility analysis, and, and uh, we were so confident that, that this is gonna be great, because the study was blinded, but we were at least seeing the blinded data, so we know what was in the placebo, what was in the treatment, we wouldn't know who is where, but just from the response rates, we were like, this is gonna be golden. And we were so ready to do a big financing. So that was March 23rd of 2018. You know, you remember these dates, right? The independent group unfolds the data and they tell us that the outcome is futile, meaning your drug, uh, the placebo is greater than the treatment. That was like, uh, uh, you know, you hear of expressions like the earth is moving below your feet, that kind of thing. It was so weird. And uh, that is probably the biggest quote unquote failure. And it was miserable. The stock goes into single digits, things like that. Uh, what saved us over there was that uh, you know, having been in the sector for so long, uh, we know that even when you do everything right, you could fail. Um, so we had multiple assets and that sort of a thing. So if one fails, you could go to the other. Now the irony is that, you know, this was an IBD drug. Uh, we were doing an ulcerative colitis study. One of the readout they do is endoscopy. And um, the CRO made an error in endoscopy readouts. So it was a human error that led to the futile outcome. But now the outcome is futile, you have terminated the study, so what are you gonna do? And, and try to convince people uh, saying, oh, it's just a human error, everything is fine. It was so tough. It took us four, six months, and then finally we uh, got the endoscopies reread, reread again, went to an independent group. Again, it's the same thing. There was an error, there was an error, there was an error. Your drug works, all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, so that, 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 that uh, is gonna stay with us forever, how painful and tough it was. But at the same time, I'm so proud of the team and everybody that we did get out of it. We did convince investors, uh, some investors, and, and said, look, uh, it's an error, and this is the data, and our drug is good. And, and fortunately, we had a backup compound, which is even more potent, so that is what we are taking into the phase two studies. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, 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 you know, biotech is a sector where uh, uh, failures are incredibly common. In fact, they are dominant. So one has to be ready for that. And, and the biggest thing you get out of this is like, uh, it, it makes you very humble. So that is why I, I, I think, and it's, it's not just me, it, it's true for so many biotech leaders, almost all of them, that uh, they are very humble because they know that uh, 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 today they could be very successful, but tomorrow um, they could be crushed. And, and uh, uh, you know, when there is success, we just start believing it has so much to do with us. Uh, well, I'm sorry, no, it has to do, it's multifactorial, including destiny. Uh, so it's a combination of things, but that is what brings the humbleness. And then once you are humble, it brings in joy also and true joy when success occurs, right? So that's, that's uh, those are the three failures I can think of. Thank you for sharing those. Yeah, no, <laughs> what's your, uh, so what's your advice to the emerging entrepreneurs out there? If you can share some advice, some wisdom, that would be great. I will put very high emphasis on 
finding out why one wants to be an entrepreneur. And, and, and the reasons are multiple fold, right? So uh, there are people who just have a granular vision and that's why they want to be entrepreneurs. There are some, and I, 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 I fall in that camp, uh, at least in the early days, that uh, I know it so much better, so I have to do it myself. Uh, and uh, rather than listening to others or whatever, working with others, well, guess what? You can become a CEO only to realize that, uh, uh, no, you are not independent. Now you have too many bosses. You have the board and uh, uh, the employees are your bosses also in a way. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's a weird cycle. But uh, so an entrepreneur has to know, what is it? Is it the grand vision? Is it just the uh, your persona is such that you just want to work independently, that sort of a thing, or in your own? Uh, or you just are very ambitious and, and uh, you want to be recognized and known or you want to make a ton of money. Each one of that is very valid, but, but figure that out because each one of that could lead to uh, different paths and, and, and choices. The, the second thing I tell people is that, uh, um, you know, get a reality check every few years because uh, I, I hope you will agree with me. Like in my case, Whatever I wanted so badly five, six years ago is not the same of, uh, as to what I want today. Oh, I so so, so it, it, it changes, right? So just because you thought you wanted to be an entrepreneur five years ago, and then you realize that, well, actually, maybe it's not that much fun, and, and uh, you are at, there are more disadvantages to being an entrepreneur rather than advantages, and it is not for you, and you will prosper better if you are an entrepreneur rather than an entrepreneur. So you have to create an honest system for yourself. Uh, that, that is very important also. The third thing, and, and I myself, included, we are all guilty as charged over here. Um, an entrepreneur like me, I have an idea, I sketch it, I create a business plan, I go to our, you know, Sand Hill Road VCs, and uh, these are smart people. They are gonna ask you tough questions. The first human reaction is, what do they know? Uh, they just don't get it. Well, maybe you didn't explain it well, or maybe the idea is not as great as you thought it was. It took me a long, long time. And even today, I'll be the first to admit that when somebody doesn't get excited about, about our pitch or our idea for the first few hours, my reaction is very negative. I, of course, keep it within myself, but after four, six, eight hours, and definitely after sleeping over it, I'd be like, oh my God, this person asked me the best questions. These are the ga holes or gaps in my thesis and, 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 and in my hypothesis. We better work at it. So this is something we have done so wonderfully at that, that protagonist. It's like we as a team would go uh, uh, and, and talk to an investor, things like that. And, and now we are a public company. So we are dealing with an uh, even more sophisticated group of investors, actually. And, and a lot of them are MDs in their own right. If not, they hire smart MDs and they will ask amazing questions. And sometimes we'll be dumbfounded and so sometimes it's like they don't get it. And, and that get a, but, but a lot of times it is like, uh, oh my God, that makes sense, that makes sense. So they will teach you. People who ask you the tough questions, people who may annoy you, they are your teachers. They are gonna teach you uh, as to how to fix your business plan, your strategy, your company vision, all of those kind of things. Uh, uh, that, that, that is something every entrepreneur needs to grasp. It's a, it's a must, I would say. Yeah, I, would, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in a few words, how would you best describe yourself? Well, I, yeah, a few words, okay. Uh, 
I believe that, uh, uh, and I encourage others to do the same thing. It's, it's like, truly try to find out what excites you, what motivates you, because that is the secret recipe. That is when work is not work anymore. And uh, everything becomes very fluent and fluid after that. It's, it's uh, easier said than done. And as I mentioned before, the definition uh, or description of what you like to do, that is gonna change every few years. So keep that in mind, right? When I was back in India, uh, uh, so, so this is when, it, when you are in your BSc, MSc, at that time, they would give us uh, gold medals if you are a first ranker, if you are first in your university, that sort of a thing, right? That was the most important thing for me. I come to Rutgers, I, uh, um, I'm done with my PhD, I'm creating my resume, and uh, I give it to my thesis at, uh, PhD advisor, Spencer Knapp, and he's like, what is this gold medal stuff? Uh, because I very proudly and, and put it in there. I'm like, I was the first ranker. Uh, then he says, just put first ranker. You know, gold medal, that, that is like as if you're an Olympian or something. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, and the weird thing is, I refused to take it out. I said, no, this is so important well, for I me. This, uh, yes. I heard it, right, yeah. yeah. So uh, then after two, three years, I finally realize what he was saying and, and, and I get rid of that and, and you know that you know. but the point is like uh, get a reality check of like what is it that you truly like to do and when you go that it's like the, 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 the universe is with you and behind you and, and, and supporting you um, but a very short narration uh, uh, version and, and it is also because people uh, have observed this in me is like at the end of the day, what would carry me is is like my energy and my confidence. Uh, everything else follows after that. Wonderful. Vinish, it's been great having you on the show. It's been lovely getting to learn about you. Fascinating story, just fascinating person. Um, very privileged to have had this time with you. And uh, hope to see you again. Wishing you all the best. Hope to see you again. No, this has this this has been wonderful. You came up with this uh, amazing choice of questions and the sequence of questions. So that that, that kind of gave me an opportunity to touch uh, all angles of my personal and professional life. And and uh, uh, you know, I, I I hope I am able to convey uh, the overall message that. I really enjoy doing what I am doing, and sure, I am 60 plus, but there is no end in sight. The journey continues because this is the journey I love. You're remarkable. You. You're remarkable. <laughs> Folks, thank you for joining us. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>